Hey, hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us this week for our From the Field Farm Chat with Idaho Wheat. My name is Ryan Mortensen. I'm the Communications and Programs Manager for the Idaho Wheat Commission. We are so glad you have joined us today. Uh, we are <clears throat> privileged to have Lee Anderson with us today for uh, our From the Field. Lee is the General Manager of Ryrie Feed and Grain Cooperative. Uh, in Ryrie over in Eastern Idaho. Uh, we are excited to hear from him today. Uh, kind of, we'll explain a little bit about the history of Ryrie Co-op, uh, what they do, what they offer, and how uh, our Idaho wheat farmers can benefit from what Lee has to share today. Uh, before we get to that, I just want to remind each of you, uh, feel free as always to uh, ask questions throughout this podcast. Uh, you can unmute, you, unmute yourself or you can use the uh, raise your hand icon in the chat and we'll make sure that those questions get asked and answered by Lee. Uh, so Lee, I will go ahead and turn the time over to you and I believe you should be able to share that screen. Well, thanks. Thanks, Ryan. And thanks for, thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk to everybody today, and I, I appreciate that uh, the Wheat Commission uh, does these things. Um, <clears throat> so I, I am the manager at Ryder Grain and Feed uh, here. I've been here since uh, 2016. I'll, I'll go over just kind of who I am and, and uh, give you a little bit of an idea of uh, my credentials, I guess. And then after I do that, you can decide whether or not whatever I have to say is worth listening to. So um, I did graduate from the University of Nebraska back in 2007. I did an internship with ConAgra Foods in Dubuque, Iowa. Um, I worked for three years as a risk management consultant. I started in 2008, right when uh, we had the first big run up in commodity prices. That was how I got my um, feet wet was wheat going 60 cents a day uh, in 2008. So I was a part of that. I did have my series three broker's license at that time. Um, then I, I met my wife and moved to Idaho. And I worked for Basic American Foods for five years and uh, did everything I could to get back into the grain industry. And uh, this, um, this job just worked out and it's been, been great for me and my family. We, we love the, the city of Ryrie and, and the cooperative uh, business model. So I've uh, been here since 2016. So it's my wife, my four girls and our little uh, Aussie doodle puppy. Um, so who is Ryder Grain and Feed Co-op? Uh, we have 3.3 uh, million bushels of storage capacity. Um, we were founded in 1927. We handle four to five million bushels of wheat and barley per year. Um, so we handle malting barley, soft white wheat, hard white spring, hard red winter, hard red spring, durum, peas, corn, uh, probably a couple of other things in here. Canola now, we've been handling a little bit of canola. Um, and about, we've got some garbs coming in this year that we'll handle. Um, we do also have a full service seed operation that, um, that we provide that service also to our patrons. We have over a, a thousand patrons that have equity in the co-op. Um, typically in a given year, we'll send, uh, patronage checks back out to about 180, uh, kind of active patrons. Um, we were like I said, it started in 1927, a group of local producers wanted better storage and market access. Uh, we became a part of Farmer's Grain Co-op in Ogden, which I don't know if uh, any of you were familiar with that, but they just tore that uh, facility down. Um, so that, that facility sold out years ago. Um, and we are the only grain marketing cooperative that's headquartered in the state of Idaho, uh, to my knowledge. I've talked to the uh, Pacific Northwest uh, Cooperative Council uh, leader and he's kind of said he's not aware of any others. So um, we do have that. It's kind of a, it makes us unique in Idaho and it's, it's a good uh, a good way to be unique and set ourselves apart. So uh, as a part of that, the cooperative model you're probably familiar with, but we've sent over uh, right at about $1.5 million uh, back to our patrons over the last three years in cash patronage. Uh, typically we'll send out 40% uh, of our profits in uh, in cash patronage and the rest will retain in equity to be paid out at a later date. Uh, this is a, a picture of our facility. Um, it's a little bit older, but uh, a good clear picture. Uh, this picture I took yesterday, this is of the um, 
our track side of the facility, we do have two different uh, spots where we can hit a rail scale and load out uh, rail onto the UP. In 2019, we did uh, this expansion. We added these three 143,000 bushel bins and a new uh, 10,000 bushel an hour leg with an overhead bin and two, two dump pits. Uh, and that's just to service our, our farmers. They, they harvest faster um, all the time, uh, bigger trucks, faster combines. And so we just needed the capacity and, and uh, space to service them. In 2023, we added this 535,000 bushel bin. Same thing, we just uh, needed to add more space. And uh, so and I think that we've uh, kind of uh, completed a few good projects over the last few years, close to a million bushels uh, to continue to, to service our growers. There's this picture I took yesterday also. So a little bit of kind of, I think what you wanted me to talk about, Ryan is uh, marketing sustainability. Sustainability is a, a big uh, hot topic keyword. Um, and, and I think that our history speaks to our sustainability. Uh, we have grown. We've, uh, our, our board of directors that's uh, locally, uh, local growers who are elected by their peers uh, have done a good job in overseeing the, the business of the cooperative. Um, and we've had good, uh, good employees and, and good management in the past that have gotten us to this point. So um, all of those things go into sustainability, and it's not so different than, than every farmer's operation. I do always tell um, our employees, and, and, and they know this, but uh, our, our farmers feel like we are a part of their operation, where we're a co-op. We feel like we're a part of their family. We feel like uh, they value us. Uh, as a partner and uh, part of their operation. So um, it's just kind of a neat thing of, of being a part of the co-op. So uh, we'll talk about some of the tools, uh, marketing tools, some resources, and then also that, that bargaining power that you kind of touched on. I'll, I'll touch on that just a little bit here. So uh, different grain marketing tools. Um, one, one of the best things, I, I've been around this for a while now. I, I feel like kind of one of the older guys, my gray hair proves it. Um, but one of the most just solid tools that we can use is a target order. Uh, when, when you're marketing grain year in and year out, uh, have that target order. It encourages real action and decisions. Um, <clears throat> those target orders will work for you basically 24 seven. There's just a few hours of the day that the, that the grain market doesn't trade. Um, it's trading more hours of the day uh, than it's closed. Uh, so those orders will work for you 24-7, no matter what you're doing out there on the farm. Uh, if you have that price set, you can have that order working for you. Uh, they are adjustable and cancelable. Um, I, sometimes I do call them uh, CIC orders, uh, cancel if close. I'll get guys that uh, uh, say, oh, the market's going up. I don't want it to fill that. But, uh, you know, in in general, um, the guys who will, will do these target orders and stick to them and do do one and then do another and, and kind of stair step into it will almost always end up better uh, in the end than somebody who just wants to sell it all at once or sells when they have to. And I'll talk about that in a minute too. Um, another tool that you can use um, are HDAs or basis contracts, uh, either side of that cash uh, pricing mechanism. You can lock in either side of that. Um, and then these, these have their place. All of these tools uh, have a time and a place. Um, HTAs can be really beneficial, especially if you have your own on-farm storage. I think HTAs are great. Um, and then there's times when when basis contracts are really good, and you want to set that basis and then wait on the wait on the futures price. Uh, options do minimum price contracts, max price contracts, or or min max, I guess, uh, bonus premiums. Uh, typically, people will will buy options. A lot of times, I do like to, to package. Uh, the sale of options in with the contract with some of my farmers. Um, you have to understand everything has a, a risk with a reward. Um, so you just have to understand the risk. There's, there's nothing out there that's a silver bullet. Um, selling at the high in hindsight is the best, uh, probably the best marketing plan. It's just really ineffective, you know, because you don't get the, the benefit of hindsight until it's too late. Um, there's there's lots of different ways to package these futures and options together to, to manage risk. Uh, so there's lots of tools out there. You just need to need to understand them and uh, 
Uh, you know, the endowed chair with the university. Um, Brian, you're going to have to help me with her name. Unmute yourself there. Shelly. Shelly, yes. And so she, she, I went to one of her classes and she's very knowledgeable, uh, knows the functions of these, uh, these types of uh, options and futures really well. Um, so she's a, a great resource that, that we have now out of the University of Idaho. Um, I, I will say, you know, with everything, there's a time and a place and options are ideal during extreme volatility. We get, you know, we've, I've seen it in my own career, you know, a half a dozen times where we'll move 50 or 60 cents in a day for several days in a row. And then all of a sudden it's, it's straight back down. Um, and we, you know, guys will say, well, it takes the stairs up and the elevator down. Um, sometimes it's, it's the elevator straight up and the elevator straight back down. We saw that here a couple of months ago. Um, so during those times of extreme volatility, uh, that's and, and when you can lock in really good profit and be reasonable too. You know, I, I have a few guys that are always seem to be their break even as a dollar a bushel above whatever the market is. You know, you, you should know your cost of production pretty well and uh, um, be able to to recognize when there's good profit. And the guys that make the most money are the ones that, that will say, hey, that's good money. I'm going to I'm going to take that. That's a good deal. And, uh, and move on to the next year and, and hopefully, uh, you know, through a bunch of base hits, they'll, they'll win the game and not try and just swing for the fence every time because that's when guys can get in trouble. Um, some more sustainable farm marketing, good marketing practices. Uh, know your cost of production. Uh, set those target orders. And, and don't get caught up in the day-to-day -day news. Use big picture long-term trends to make your plan. Uh, do current conditions warrant being bullish on 100% of your crop uh, or production, 60% or 30%, and and kind of make your plan from there and set your target orders from there. Um, you know, right right now there's if you look hard enough, you can justify whatever position you want to have. If I want to be bearish, I can go find all sorts of reasons why the market is just going to go straight to zero. Or in the case of oil and, and uh, you know, when we had COVID, it could go negative, right? I could make all sorts of reasons for all of those things. And wheat's not going to do that. But uh, um, I, I just think there's information out there that you can justify whatever your position is. Um, so you just have to be careful. And, and uh, in, in general, um, use, use the big picture um, supply and demand fundamentals. The, the poor marketing things, when, when I see guys, uh, too often I'll see, I'll have guys that just say, I, I want to wait and see what it does. Well, what happens when you wait and you see the peak, the only way to see the peak is to see the other side, right? You've seen the market come way up and you're like, oh, look, it's great. And you don't know that it's, you know, where the peak is until you start to see it come back down. And then we just say, oh, I, if I could just get that price back, then I'll sell. And too often it, it never does come back. Um, the other poor marketing things that I'll see is, is somebody will say, well, I don't need the money. So now I'll wait and see, I don't need the money until January. So I'm going to wait and see what the market is in January. And that's, that's not a good reason to base your decision to sell or not sell, you know, your decision to sell or not sell should be more on, on the underlying fundamentals and what you think the potential for a rally is versus I just want to wait and see, um, because I don't need the cash right now. Or vice versa, you know, those guys that, that don't need the money at some point, they do, you know, and they call it the John Deere low in the spring for a reason because guys have to make their uh, their equipment payments. And so they, they sell grain to get cash for that. So you don't want to be in that situation where the bank is calling for a payment. And so you need to come and turn your grain into cash at the elevator that day so you can take your money over there. There was 364 days to, to market that grain or even longer. You market grain two years out. Um, so there's there's lots of time. So don't wait until you have to. The guys that wait until they have to uh, go make a payment or something to sell their grain, 90% of the time, it's it's near the low. It, it just doesn't work out for them most every time. Um, it's just a, a, a poor marketing strategy. Um, so marketing resources, there, there's touched on this a little bit already. There's lots of news out there. There's all sorts of uh, subscription things that you can uh, subscribe to. And th there's a few good ones. Um, a, a few maybe bad ones 
uh, Twitter or X, I think they call it now, I feel old, uh, Facebook. Um, there's lots of commercial training or consulting companies out there. Some, some are, I think, vastly better than others. Um, there's a few of my guys that use a few uh, trading uh, indicators and, and, and they're pretty good. Um, but there's a, a lot that, that kind of become that self-fulfilling prophecy when I want the market to go up. So I'm going to justify that with a whole bunch of reasons of why I think, you know, Iowa's not going to have a hundred and or 200 bushel crop because there's, there's little spots that are flooded out. You know, I can just try and justify it all of these ways. Um, but by and large, um, we, we don't know all of the information. So we need to just try and keep that, you know, take everything that everybody says with a little bit of a grain of salt, because if, if they, if, if the people that we pay for information really knew, they wouldn't be selling us that information for uh, you know fifty dollars a month or whatever that is. So um, it, it's all uh, when, when I first started in the the industry, one of the the old guys said, uh, "Lee, you got to write this market report on what the market is doing, kind of the market update and stuff." And I've done those for a long time now. But uh, what he said at that time is like, "It's always the new guy that has to do this because those old guys we hate doing it." We know that it's, you know, we, we never really know what the market's going to do. Somebody's got to do it. So we just make the new guy do it. So a lot of times those kind of market reports, you might have just the new guy fresh out of college that, that has to do that because uh, cause that's just what he has to do for that day. Um, but no, nobody wants to be the one to feed the bears either. You might, you'll see the complainers like out there on Twitter or Facebook or something uh, of, of why the market is, is uh, way underpriced because the production isn't going to be there. You'll see those guys being the vocal ones, the complainers. Um, but the guy who's doing a really good job and going to raise close to 300 bushel corn, he maybe isn't isn't you know bragging about how good his crop looks. Um, just and that's just the nature of farmers. They're not they're not they're not out there to brag. Um, charts and charting strategies th those can be a resource. Um, there's there's a few triggers on some of those charts that that you maybe want to be aware of but i always say those charts are only as good as the underlying fundamentals allow them to be um and i'll show that more in a second one of the resources i really like is cmegroup.com they have just a, a few great charts people probably get tired of me sending out those same charts all the time when i send out my market update but i think they're just a great uh, a great visual tool uh, over here on this side of the screen. You can kind of see um, this is one of those charts that you can get out off, off of this, uh, this link right there. And it's just a great kind of visual to see the long-term trends and those bigger trends and maybe then get a bias of do, should I be more bullish on my marketing plan or should I be pretty protective of, in, in my marketing plan? Um, here's one of these charts. So if I'm a chartist, I can say, well, here's a trend. Here's another trend. Now, now we're back this way. We saw a bounce. We're going to see a double top or something here, a head and shoulders. And, and I start drawing all these lines on here until pretty soon, you know, boom, it gets blown up. And, you know, and that, you know, that hopefully is more figurative than literal, uh, Mr. Putin. But, uh, you know, this is, this is what can happen to, to one of those charts. It's good until it isn't. So take, take the charts all the time with a grain of salt and, you know, it's the underlying fundamentals that are, that are going to shock the market and completely upend the chart. So don't, don't put all your eggs into the chart basket by any means. Uh, this is an old graphic. I saw this when I was in college, um, you know, nearly 20 years ago now. And uh, at some point I probably should write a book on, on psychology of farm marketing. Um, because everybody, it's one of those things, like everybody thinks like, hey, I'm the only one that worries about this, or I'm the only one, that, everybody hates it. I've, I don't know if I could count on one hand the number of, of farmers I've ever worked with in my whole career that just said, I love selling my grain. I love it. That They don't. It's. Uh, I think that if you look at what that grain means to a farmer, uh, they've spent, you know, essentially a whole year uh, preparing the ground, doing the inputs, working on the equipment, spending long hours in the middle of the night changing water, uh, working on pivots, uh, stressing about mother nature. By the time you finally get that grain in your hands, that's, that's you know, in, in their mind, that's what my time is worth. That's what my last year has been worth. This, this whatever I sell this for is going to be rep represent what, what I feel like I'm worth. And so they, it's never enough and they, they always want more, right? And 
deservedly so, but the fact is the market, um, the economic market doesn't necessarily value uh, that grain with the same, you know, um, degree that, that, that a farmer might. And just the, the economics of the market will dictate what it's worth, you know, what a buyer is willing to buy it at, what a seller is willing to sell it at. And so uh, we just have to kind of be cognizant of that emotion and that attachment uh, to the grain and, and kind of disconnect that a little bit. Um, and I'd also encourage farmers, uh, farm families to involve their wife in the, in the grain marketing plan because they don't show, the studies have shown they don't show that kind of physical or you know, emotional attachment to their grain. You know, they, there's a saying that uh, farmers hug their grain bins tighter than they hug their wives. You know, that that's, they say that for a reason. They just don't want to let that go uh, because I think it, of what it represents to them. And uh, uh, including your wife in there, I think, can just bring a whole nother uh, degree of, of separation away from that connection to, to the grain and just help you make uh, more sound decisions, honestly. Uh, this is that U.S. all wheat ending stocks versus the stocks to use ratio. Uh, stocks to usage ratios are, are the measure of scarcity. And those are the ones I look, look at the most to really kind of get an indication of like, should I be a little bit more bullish on my marketing plan or should I be more you know, bearish or, or protective uh, in my marketing plan? How, how many bushels, what percent of my bushels do I want to be bullish on? And when the stocks to use ratio is high, uh, like we're kind of going back into right now, you want to be a little bit more protective when it's going lower, like, you know, we were in 22, uh, having a little bit more unsold isn't, isn't a bad thing. Um, so now uh, talk about leveraging bargaining power, uh, kind of a shameless plug is that's what the, the Capper Volstead Act was, right? Uh, for um, <clears throat> farmers to be able to leverage their, their bargaining and, uh, and marketing power uh, without uh, facing any antitrust um, violations. Um, so the cooperative model, um, I would argue, is, is one way for especially the smaller farmers now to continue to gain um, that uh, bargaining power. And, and one thing I've always been proud of uh, at the co-op is that we treat everybody the same, whether you're, you farm 30,000 acres or whether you farm 20 or 30 acres. We have a lot of, a lot of barley farmers that, that have grown barley for us for you know, 30 or 40 years, and they, they have 20 or 30 acres. And when it comes for our annual meeting, they have the same vote as the guy with 30,000 acres. And, and I, I just appreciate that model because uh, uh, it gives the, the smaller guys a say, and uh, it's, it's served us well. And I think that our, our performance over the, the last 90 years uh, will attest to that. Um, but then it's not just the cooperative, but any grain elevator's job in the market is to provide service to both the grower and the end user. We've got a lot of great elevators in, in eastern Idaho and the state of Idaho and, and end users also. Um, so I'm not going to um, tell you that there aren't other really great people at this business uh, in eastern Idaho because there's, there's a lot. There's a lot of really great men and women that work, uh, work in this industry. So um, find somebody that you have a good relationship with. And, and just try and, and uh, foster that relationship um, with them. <clears throat> and, uh, and it's not always, you know, th there's things that uh, you can have a, have a win-win. You don't always have to just, uh, it, any, anything that's too one-sided or too selfish isn't gonna be really very long-term. So um, everybody in the industry, um, I think kind of realizes that. Uh, our, our job, so we'll, we'll provide, our farmers with uh, storage, market access, uh, liquid market, uh, information resource uh, records. Also, um, we, we have recently, um, in the last few years, utilized Bushel, uh, the Bushel wallet uh, or the Bushel app. And uh, so that enables our growers to get real time information and hopefully make uh, better decisions and to really see um, where they're at, um, they get their, their contracts all through the app. They can do e-sign. Um, so we've, we've used, utilized technology in ways like that to just try and keep up with the times. Uh, average farm size is growing. Uh, and I would just say, uh, as you market your grain, um, no matter how big you are, understand the cost of farm storage, especially in the last few years as I've sat down with some guys and, 
and gone over the cost of, of that farm storage, like, man, it's just not worth it for me to put it in the bin for 20 or 25 cents. You know, it, it's got to be more than that. By the time you pay for freight, storage, handling, interest, labor, your, you know, your own time, uh, you know, would, would you rather be going on vacation in January or would you rather be hauling grain in the snow? Um, so I, th I think that 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 is a lot of value that is what I've had that conversation with guys like it's just not worth it for me. We'd rather bring it to you. And that's why we've continued to expand our storage so that we can get the economies of scale and uh, and offer our our growers a service that uh, that they want. So uh, and then I would also ask yourself, you know, if you do have farm bins, are your farm bins a speculative tool or a logistical tool? And in some cases, you know, depending on where your farm is at, uh, logistically, they, they make an awful lot of sense. But I would just use them. Um, make sure you're marketing them appropriately and and uh, th that it's not just a, a speculative tool one i'm going to wait and see if the price goes up after i put it in there you can you can have the grain sold before you put it in the bin and sell the carry and and make sure that you're going to get you know lock in 40 or 50 cents in carry and it it'll it'll pay for itself that way but if it's just always a speculative tool i would kind of discourage uh growers from from using them in that way because i don't think in the long run that that's a but that's a good a good plan. Um, that's really all I've got. Um, let me go back to the previous slide. Just back to our our facility here. So I don't know if anybody has any questions or anything for me. Lee, are you ever completely full with your grain bins? Are you ever at capacity? Um, yes and no. Um, th this year we'll probably get there, but. Uh, uh, we have done ground piles in the past, and for that reason, I'll say no. <laughs> that we'll we'll just keep piling it. But at a certain point, you know, we, we could sure be full. And, th and this year is a challenge, right? I I never want to turn away any grain. Uh, this year, with what uh, the malt barley situation that turned into feed barley, and kind of how that all played out, we're, we're fuller than we would like to be because a lot of growers. Uh, didn't really know for sure if they were going to get accepted or rejected in Anheuser Busch uh, until recently. I think they they were thinking that yeah, this probably isn't going to work, but they were holding on to this hope that they might change their mind and go ahead and accept some of that sprouted grain from last year. And then, you know, just here in the last 30 days, decided that we better throw in the towel and get rid of this and make some space. And so yeah. that, that's put a little bit of a strain on on our elevator and I think a lot of others around. Eastern Idaho also. Um, and it's just, you know, the, the economy has, has started to slow, uh, and which you've seen in the stock market the last few weeks. And I think that uh, um, I've talked to freight companies and, and end users, you know, flour millers and whatnot. And, and it just seems like sales haven't been, been great. Maybe now in the last, you know, couple of weeks, it's going to pick, it's picked up a little bit here. Um, but even, you know the the maltsters and the the beer uh, beer sales and whatnot have kind of been off. So uh, hopefully we can see those things turn around and see uh, you know if the the Fed drops interest rates that maybe that'll spur a little bit more uh, economic activity here. So can you talk a little bit about how how the co-op issues? challenges such as addresses issues such as market volatility weather uh especially in that area of the state where you know weather's always unpredictable um so one one of the the things that we've done uh, here in the last since, since i've been here is that we, we have started um hedging our grain uh we had been more back to back so uh, by doing that, it, it allows us as the co-op a little bit more flexibility to um, to see what the crop is going to be before we decide when and where we're going to market that to. And it also uh, enables us to, to gain a little bit of leverage, um, which is what we were intended for in, in day one, right, uh, to collectively market those things and enables us to do that a little bit better. Uh, we have... We're always looking at, at new uh, wheat varieties and, and barley varieties of what can be drought tolerant, what can handle uh, a little bit less water, 
um, that kind of thing. Um, so we're, we're constantly looking at that. We did recently license a, a wheat variety from the University of Idaho um, that's called, it's a soft white spring called UI Warrior. Um, so that's just one of those things that trying to keep, keep the new varieties going uh, to keep the, um, you know, increasing our yields and maximizing our production because at the end of the day, that's really the only thing that the grower has the most control over. Um, is his own production, which is kind of a double-edged just catch-22, right? Like, I can't, I can't get more money out of it, so I'm going to produce more. And then we produce more, and then we have a harder time getting more money out of it because we have more, you know. But, but that's just, I don't, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. I think we're going to continue to see um, big yields out of, uh, out of all grain in general. So Lee, could you talk a little more about your seed program and you know how you pick varieties to bring into your seed program, the kind of information you provide to your growers on varieties, and and how that kind of fits into your your co-op plans long term? Yeah, uh, so we we decided uh, oh I think it was 2017 to really invest uh, and kind of reinvest a bunch of uh, um, dollars into our seed facility. Um, we, we built a new plant, uh, moved a bunch of, moved all of that uh, production over and away from our commercial facility to get the, any treated grain away from, from our commercial stuff and just kind of separate those two things a little bit. Um, and when, when we did that, um, we, we started looking at, at a lot more varieties. Um, we've done some trials in the past. Um, we've had some really great uh, farmers that have worked with us. And, and what we found when when we did a kind of our own two acre strip trials uh, was we really were dead on with Juliet Marshall's data. And it actually surprised me that, that how close our, our two acre strip trials were to her small data. Um, and, and you, you kind of have to get a variety out there and give it a few seasons to really get growers seasoned on how it is and, and see it through a few uh, different cycles and, and how it performs. Um, but uh, we were encouraged by, by that, just that what we see uh, out of Juliet's information, I think is pretty pretty dang close to what what we're going to see in in the field. Um, but our our variety selection, uh, we grow a little bit more hard white spring wheat, maybe than some as a percentage than some other areas, just because it works good on our uh, dry farm acres, and we have a lot of uh, um, irrigated acres that, that like it also. Um, so we've, we've been, always pushed for, you know, a high yielding uh, wheat there. We're, we're going a little bit away from, you know, we've done Dane in the lot, the past a lot, but the quality isn't quite there. So uh, we're going to go a little bit more towards UI gold uh, because it is a little bit more of uh, a desirable uh, milling wheat that, that still hopefully competes with the, the kind of yield that, that Dane has had. And Dane's been a really, really good one for us, especially on a lot of the dry farm, really durable wheat. But, so, so quality is an issue in that selection process as well, I gather. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's, yeah. You know, it's, there, there's been a few that uh, that maybe we liked agronomically that that uh, flour mills have just said no, we don't sure. we don't want that. You know. Sure. So and every year is a little bit different, and that makes it a little bit of a challenge that that maybe one year based on the growing conditions that year a certain variety doesn't mill as well, and in, in the next year it might. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day we really need something that can perform pretty well year in and year out. So if it has an Achilles heel, it, it, it isn't as, des as desirable for us. What do you see coming in so far um, this year? And how do you segregate grain coming in, Lee? What do you have a, you have a strategy in advance or kind of wing it as it goes? Obviously uh, a lot of diversity out there. Oh yeah. We'll, we'll create, I'll create a, a bin plan. I, I know pretty well uh, what I think that we're going to get um, as I've done this, more times I get a better feel for it all the time, but uh, um, we kind of just <clears throat> kind of have to, we, we've only got so many ways that we can segregate just based on, you know, the volume that we're going to take and the limited number of bins that we have. So I, I just have to kind of make that call of like, uh, here's, here's the bins I set aside for that specific commodity. And then as it starts to come in, then I'll segregate based on what we're seeing. Um, so th there's been, there's been times when, you know, we get halfway through harvest and I go, oh, I got this backwards. I need, I need a big bin for, you know, this low protein and a little bin for the high protein, you know, because it kind of flip flops halfway through. Um, but so far, the quality this year has been really good. 
Uh, everything that we've seen has been good. There's isolated spots of, of uh, frost and yield damage, but by and large, uh, the, all the wheat that we've seen has been pretty good test weight. There's been there's a few winter wheat fields that were a little bit lower uh, test weight, but so far the, the malting barley and the hard red spring wheat and hard, uh, let's see, so we've taken, oh, hard white, we've taken about every class so far and in the last few days the, the test weights have all been been really good so we've seen 62 63 pound uh hard white 60 pound soft white spring so uh it's, it's been been a good quality so far which is a welcome change from last year so cross your fingers that we don't get any rain uh this weekend here so <laughs> All right, Lee, great information. Thank you so much. We appreciate all that and appreciate what you do for the for the industry and for our wheat farmers. So thanks for joining us today. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. For those uh, on the call, thank you for joining as well and for your questions. And just a reminder, uh, this podcast will be available for you to rewatch, to share with your friends, your neighbors, fellow farmers. It will be up on our social media platforms. Uh, podcast page and also our website. Um, we also hope to see you back here soon in a couple weeks. Uh, our topic will be uh, the research being done about developing soft white wheat for Idaho. Until then, have a great day and we will see you next time.